Okay, so welcome to the second creator's talk, and I'm really happy to welcome uh, Robin Mulder. She's the head of Three Pounds Games, and she will tell you all on how to ditch your controller and work in mixed reality. Hi there, I am Robin Mulder, and uh, I have been working in VR for quite some time. We started off in uh, 2016 working with the Vive. Some of you might be familiar with that. How many of you are um, new to, well, this is your first AWE. Got a few, that's great. So you like it so far? Good, good. Having a good time? Excellent, excellent. Okay, let me get this clicker working here. Come on. You got no clicker. Oh, I didn't know I had a laser. This could be fun. Ooh. Okay. Um, so we are. We started off as a game company, and what we did was build a lot of core systems and libraries to be able to build our own amazing, incredible, immersive stuff. Heavily into VR, I saw this as the future. You could do. I, I could put you anywhere. I could train you in a hospital from your your home. Why wouldn't I do this? Well, people have a little bit of trouble with that, with the movement, the motion sickness, just some of the technology wasn't quite there yet. So as we've all sort of evolved over time, uh, we've found that you know the technology is getting better and better. And now that mixed reality is getting better and better, we've sort of pivoted into more of a, a hybrid uh, technology accelerator where we're taking our courses to the libraries and working with subject matter experts to help them build incredible AR, VR, whatever they want to do. Uh, so with that in mind, if I hit the right button, that would be great. Um, what I wanted to introduce you to was pass-through mixed reality and hand tracking. This is an area of focus that we've been really heavily into. We want to provide some lessons learned from our background, our enterprise background, as well as our gaming background. We're on the cutting edge. I sometimes will sit there for two hours just trying to get a controller to work on some kind of new headset. And that's a brutal space to be, but everybody can benefit from these lessons learned because we're always ahead. We're always downloading the latest SDK and the latest APIs and leveraging those technologies. So we are on the verge of a seismic shift of technology and with every evolution comes a whole lot of new terms. You probably know this one because you're at Augmented World Expo. Um, augmented Reality, Pokemon Go, I had to put that in there because we've all seen it 10 million times. But it really showcases what Augmented Reality originally is and kind of still is today. This is an overlay, you're past the camera, you're just looking at a camera feed and you're overlaying data onto that. And technically that's the X-Real up where previously known as the N-Real. Same kind of deal. Definitely much better in newer technology, but in the headset. And you'll see a wide variety of headsets out on the floor that use these technologies. And from my perspective as a, as a virtual reality developer, like this is kind of like top down from mobile. We're coming like bottom up from like the full experience. And heads up display, you'll see a lot of those as well. Heads up display is kind of a precursor to augmented reality. This is more what people used to do before we called it augmented reality. The flight sims over there, the, uh, that's actually the motorcycle helmet with the, the you know, navigation. These are stuck to your face. They're not going anywhere. There's no, you can't like look around or any of that sort of thing. Big difference when you're talking about mixed reality holograms and all the other things. So holograms, First of all, I'm curious to know, where's that clip, where's the thing, there we go. A, B, C, hologram, is this a real hologram? What do you guys think, yes or no? Uh, hey, raise your hand for a yes, real hologram? That is a real hologram. Real hologram? That is also a real hologram. How about this guy? Not a real hologram. <laughs> This guy is what's called the Pepper's Ghost Illusion. And you may be familiar with this if you've ever been to Disney, Haunted Mansion, and you're driving your cart and you get in the thing and then suddenly there's a ghost in your cart. That's Pepper's Ghost. That was like 1821 technology. 
Um, it's very, very simple technology. You can do it at home with a, a plexiglass film and like a TV and you just put the angle just right and the angle of reflection and all that sort of thing. And suddenly you have a, like what looks to be a hologram as a ghostly image. Mixed reality, so mixed reality is a whole lot more cameras. Uh, we have because we need depth. We need to be able to see what's going on and be able to walk around things and be able to. We're also still kind of overlaying uh, imagery. And you probably saw the new announcement just yesterday where the Quest 3 has finally been announced, which is great for all of us in the industry. Um, that's going to be just a really big move in the industry because there's going to be massive improvements for these cameras. There's going to be massive improvements for, for how you interact and the scene understanding and the depth. Next week, it's going to be a whole nother evolution when Apple announces something, I hope. So to get into a little bit of history on, on uh, pass-through mixed reality, pass-through and mixed reality are kind of the same thing. Uh, mixed reality is a term that was made up by Microsoft. Well, I, they didn't actually make it up, but they kind of co-opted it. They had uh, built a mixed reality headset at one point. And they thought, hey, everyone's going to replace all of their computer screens and just plug this in. And they're right, but not yet. Uh, that's what I actually see that Apple's going to do. Apple's going to go for the play of, I'm going to put that Apple headset on. I don't need screens. From, I don't even need the computer. It's all right here. Everything's right here. And I'm going to be able to like, use my computer that's just my, my Apple headset which is why it's going to cost between three and $5,000, because that's the vision there. So you walk into your next room, you have your big screen television. I go back to my computer. Oh, I have my computer anywhere I want. I, I can see a future where we all go to these hotels and there are no televisions in the room because you, everybody's got one in their head. So also in this, so the first one, the first PMR 2016 single camera, obviously that's not very good. Um, graphics were related to the real world. The modern PMRs use multiple cameras. Again, this is about, it's about depth, it's about clarity, more cameras, more accuracy, you know, immersive experience. And you can see yourself, you can see your hands. That's a big deal. Um, this is really just the beginning with all of this technology. As it gets better and better, we're just, it's just gonna feel seamless. Right now, you put on the Quest 2, uh, it's grainy, if you look a pass-through, it's not terrible, but you're not picking up your phone and going, oh, I got a text message. What is that? You, you're not going to do that. Um, let's hope the Quest 3 can do that. So this guy here, this is, a, this is an example of some of our mixed reality, just to kind of show like the current clarity of where we are. This is the Quest Pro. So that's, that's pretty damn clear. So you can only imagine if the Quest 3 is gonna be better than this, you're gonna, you're gonna be able to do more things. You're gonna be able to look up at your screens, your other screens, you're gonna be able to integrate your real world a lot more easily. Going to hand tracking, um, 2016, this is, my, uh, this is my workstation in 2016. Um, this was the Blocks demo. It's kind of a famous in my world. And we, there's a little, a little piece of device. It was called the Leap Motion. It's now called the Ultra Leap now. And we used to stick it, we used to glue it to the front of our headsets. Uh, anybody in the industry will, will recall, there we go, right? Natalie remembers this. It was friggin' cool. We couldn't believe it. We're like, everybody's going to want to do this. But that's a lot. That's a lot. Download the SDK, install this thing on this device, make sure the device is thing, plug this thing into this thing. And oh, by the way, everything has wires everywhere. Now you can do hand tracking. Who's going to do that in 2016? So we were very, very excited about it at the time because, you know, this had the opportunity to change the world, but all the other underlying technologies just weren't there yet. So a lot of us kind of like stepped away for a while. We're like, okay, well, it's going to be controllers for now. So you fast forward a bit, and we get into what are, what are more recent breakthroughs. Um, improved accuracy and responsiveness, direct touch, controller in hand. Um, a lot of these, some of these are terms that uh, Meta has made up, too. So 
direct touch is a specific thing that they've called it, and that is like pokeballs. Have you ever heard of pokeballs? When you have like a, a mixed reality screen in front of you here, it's like a button, and you push it, your 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 real, your fake hand and your real hand are lined up, you know, properly and spatially, and you push that and it stops. So then your brain goes, oh, I, I got stopped, even though obviously you're just pushing air. So it looks really funny. It's a little minority report is when you're like, boop, 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 boop. Um, but I love that. I think that's great. So that also led to them then getting into controller plus hand. So actually, just like how I'm holding this thing right now, in the current uh, meta stack, if you put direct touch on, I think it's still in experimental phases, but if you go in and you set that up, that screen, you can, you can take your control with your hand and keep it in your hand and you can do this and you'll see that your hand pose stays like this and you can do this and like this. That's pretty great because you want to be able to like still press your buttons, that's important. Uh, predictive location, super important because you know what I can't do, I can't see things behind my head. That's a problem. So humans are extraordinarily predictive. If you have some cue flying at you, from over there, I know what you're going to try to do. I know, even if your hand's over here and I can't see your hand, you're going to try to move your hand here. So I have like point A, point B, I know where it's going to go, I can kind of figure that out. So that really helps with that mapping of like what your hand is and how, the, how your, your, uh, your avatar maps to the actual tracking in the scene because I can kind of guess pretty well. If I get a little bit wrong, your brain's going to be okay with that. This is just going to get better and better. And also the sensors are getting better and better. So the wider the, the field of view is, the wider those ranges are on those cameras for like tracking, we're going to actually know where your hand is. We're going to actually know where everything is. So then the prediction over top of that is just going to make it even more accurate. Fast hand tracking, uh, that's a fun topic. The, um, the current hand tracking, there, it's a bit slow right now. There is fast hand tracking. And it is clocked to the frequency of your, your actual, how many hertz are coming out of your wall. And that goes back to old camera technology. So if you're in Europe, your fast hand tracking is 50 hertz. And if you're in America, it's 60. Uh-oh. Um, this could be solved. <laughs> uh, but that's, it's an interesting problem to consider. And it is really important because when you're moving your hand around and if it doesn't track properly, you break immersion so fast. But fortunately, a little bit of the faking with the predictive location will really help with that. So when your avatar moves and the hand track moves and it's close enough, you're going to be a little forgiving about that. So I think by the time we get that new Apple headset and the new Quest 3, everybody's going to be flipping out about how great hand tracking is, and they're going to start moving into this new world where they realize all of the possibilities of what they can do. Body tracking is really coming along nicely as well. I have a cool video on that. Um, so, you know, this goes back to that whole, like, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and his legs thing that was quite humorous. Yeah, we can do this. We can do body tracking. We can, we can predictably show like where are the pieces are in your mind. And again, it goes back to poses. You can go into any library, animation libraries, and you can just be like, I want to run animation. And they're going to have a character that runs. And some of us don't run that well. But still, it's a human running. So as long as you're still a basic human, it's going to be very similar. So that means that they can use a lot of that same information and like biometrics information to do the predictive uh, search on body tracking. So I'm pretty sure this is how your body's going to go. So therefore, that is what happened. My wish list is one controller and one hand. And I've told about 3,000 people this. So let's hope this happens. Um, my thought here is that this is what humans do. I mean, I, I'm holding two things right now, but that's actually pretty rare. A lot of times when you're going around your house, just pay attention to it. What do you do? You pick up a drill. I pick up one drill. What am I doing with my other hand? I'm like, I'm, I might be holding something else with it. I might be holding a screw. I might be like looking at a manual and I might be pressing one button. Most tools have a couple buttons and it's usually one hand. 
So to have to hold two controllers is really problematic. I want people to have a hand free, and then they could do menu stuff with their like dominant hand, and they could do like controller stuff with their non-dominant hand, or whatever is right for them. The potential here is absolutely huge. Intuitive interaction. I mean, this really just goes back to the we are spatial creatures. We're always walking around, gesturing with our hands, touching things with our hands, pushing buttons all over the place. If I can do that in, in mixed reality and I can see the world and I can like just, you know, overlay the items that I need to do, it's going to feel good to me. And right now, the biggest problem with adoption is people get into VR and they do the grabby, grabby, this is too complicated, I don't know what I'm doing moment, and we have to get rid of that moment. Mixed reality is the, is the key to getting other people on board. It. Most people don't have that, that, if you're here, you have the ability to get over the hump that technology can be hard sometimes and that's okay and I'm gonna muscle through it. Some people don't have that. Some people have the, my computer didn't turn on, so therefore I'm not even going to bother. Or Zoom didn't work. I give up. I'm going home. Um, so when we can just put a headset on you and don't have to give you controllers, and you're just going, oh, doot, 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 doot. I'm good. I can do this. Great. That's huge. Uh, improved accessibility, it's, it's going to be clear that that's going to help out a lot, that we're just going to be able to do that. Enhance realism. If I'm in the real world, boom, done. Social interaction, if I'm waving my real fingers, good to go. And gestures, you know, just start paying attention to your gestures. I'm going to run out of time real quick. The combined potential is huge. It's going to increase immersion. We're going to have realistic object interaction, enhanced presence, because it's really you doing the stuff. Gesture-based input, and think of the possibilities there. This is one of the games that we're working on right now. Let's see if I can get a little quick video. So this looks pretty simple, but the reality here is this is multiplayer hand tracking pass through deterministic physics. Oh my. So when I'm in the scene, all these little characters, everybody sees the same little characters and the physics is accurate across those little characters. That will make it socially present because everybody's seeing and experiencing the same thing at the same time. This is one of our accelerator projects. Um, little feetsies, there's little feetsies. Check it out, body tracking, how cool is that? Do, 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 do. Yeah, that's the future right there. And this is a friend of mine, uh, Gabriel Williams, Polysketch. He's one of the original builders of Pro Builder. He's working on this application. The idea there is to give people the ability to do this in mixed reality and to build models that you can then import into your games and applications. So this is really super cool. I'm really looking forward to working with him on, on some things. Like, just imagine just sitting there playing around with this. is like Lego. And then you could go and build your own application with these Lego pieces that you built in mixed reality. So there are challenges. There's always challenges to all of these things. Accuracy and precision. Again, let's just hope for some new hardware. That's going to be great. But occasionally, you know, you get into these things. With occlusion, for example, if I put my hands together, I'm like touching them and stuff. That's going to be a little bit of a problem right now. That's going to get better. Latency, that distance between, like, if I'm in the real world, like, what happens in that time frame, that just needs to get a little closer and closer. Hand gestures and posures, we, we need to uh, have more of a uniform language for that. There's, you know, a lot of pinch, poke, spread, fist. Everybody's got those pretty common ones, but a lot of us sort of you know, complain about like flying. If I want to fly in VR, do I Superman or do I want to like gesture? You know, we do, we do many different uh, options and people have personal preferences about this. Um, environmental lighting is the biggest problem right now with mixed reality. Any headset manufacturer will tell you that is their number one complaint from consumers. And you're just like, you know, you can put an IR light in your headset so they're going to have to fix that. They're going to have to make it so that people have less of an issue about lighting and that they could actually do hand tracking in the dark. That would be cool. Um, fatigue, who wants to hold their arms over their head for a while. And user intent detection. So sometimes you do get people that do some wild different things. You can't always predict everything, so sometimes that's going to be a little weird. I am rushing now. 
a little bit on the design strategies, um, natural interaction. One thing is always to think about, you know, how do you really do things in real life? And that can be difficult because you're trying to get people to do things in a, in a world where it's different in here and sometimes too bad, you're just gonna have to do it this way and we're gonna have to onboard you. But the closer that we can make it a natural spatial interaction, the better the user's gonna be able to do it. Like, theoretically, you should just be able to put the headset on somebody and say, well, just figure it out. And that's the dream, is that we don't really have to onboard you very much at all. And if we can get you through mixed reality, then you'll start to be willing to try out other technologies, like deeper interactions, movement control in virtual reality, for example. Uh, audio, and, audio and visual feedback is super key. Spatial audio is probably the biggest, most important thing when it comes to mixed reality, because I'm standing in this room and now I have to figure out a way to like, you know, bring you into the invisible world of what it's like to be now immersed into this world. In virtual reality, you can, you can rely a little bit more on the scene. I still say that it's important either way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm running out of time, unfortunately. Uh, so just a few other things. Performance optimization is gonna be a big consideration. You can't have a gazillion things in mixed reality right now. It's just gonna crash and burn. So you just have to make some design choices about that. Keep it simple, always. And you know, as you build up something simple today, in a couple of years when we have new headsets, you can add the complexity then. Collision avoidance is kind of a big topic too because you don't want people tripping over things. That's not good. Don't want to get sued about that. And contextual guidance as well. If you're doing something where you, um, in Space Dragon, we, we do an interesting contextual thing. It's not so much about mixed reality, but it's a very shooting thing. And we didn't want to have more buttons for laser beams. So when it is you're pointing at this thing, it changes into a beam only when it is allowed to be that thing. And you can do that sort of same sort of thing in any modality. So mixed reality, same thing. If there's an opportunity to remove the burden from the player and say, oh, I know this is what you're gonna do because this state has happened, this scenario is happening, then do that and make it easy on them as long as they can like back out of it too, like when they move away from it, it switches off of that, that, you know, that switch. Um, and test, test, test. That's, that's the biggest thing I ever say, like test with lots of user groups. Yeah, I think, I think they could just read this one. I think we're good to go. <laughs> I actually just threw this in there for a second just because this is something we'd like to do in mixed reality. Um, it seems kind of weird, but like nursing, they have a big trouble right now with uh, using virtual reality and the movement. And although it would still waste a hospital room to do this in mixed reality, it still saves on all the parts. They don't have to open any packages they don't have to reconfigure the room. So it's still a saving. So that's kind of another design consideration is even if it still seems wasteful to do something in mixed reality, consider that the users may only be able to handle mixed reality and that's okay. You could still save and get some ROI on this project. It may not be the maximum ROI you could get with, with virtual reality. You get no conclusions. <laughs> Lots of expertise and experience here. Do you have any questions? We have two minutes for questions. I can bring the mic or you can. Hey, my name is Aditi. Uh, I work at Walmart and so I'm very interested in the business application side of things. Just curious which industries you think you know, are, are exciting for AR, VR, and mixed reality in terms of business oh, applications. Like all of them, <laughs> all of them. You, this is one of the things about like, being at AWE and you'll see that we're cutting across like every single vertical that's possible because this is the future. This is how we're gonna interact with computers in the future. And once we can get over all these little bumps and lumps about you know, how we're interacting and, and you know, just deciding on methodologies and, and what's the future in common language, everything, manufacturing, medical, I mean, I, I, I can't think of a space that this isn't going to touch, quite frankly. I mean, we're gonna people, people in space. 
how am I going to train you to work on, uh, in space? I have to do it here. So that means I have to replicate everything. I have to digital twin little everything. Apple has already digital twinned all of you guys. They did it years ago. So what are they going to do next? They're going to come out next week and they're going to be like, hey, you know what FaceTime is now? That little Memoji is going to pop up. There it is right there in your face. It's going to be incredible. And people are going to start to see that possibility across the world of, wow, I didn't realize we could do that and I could do that for my job. All of those PowerPoints, goodbye. Um, how much do you find that the um, technology around headsets and other kind of interfaces for experiencing mixed reality are holding back some of this innovation? And how do you anticipate that evolving? Oh, they're completely holding back innovation. All of us developers know what's possible and what we could do. It's a, it's a fundamental problem of product road mapping. And we've always solved this with Apple. So Apple put out that first iPhone. You know what it didn't have? Apps. That was not a thing. They were like, oh, web, web, X, web VR, that's going to be the thing, right? So the web uh, component was supposed to be what apps became. And then they realized, wait a minute, that's probably not a great idea. And then that's when the App Store evolution came out. So they ended up product road mapping down this line. And then they have to hold back because people have to buy the technology, get used to technology, and then move on. That $400 headset that's now $299 from Meta would be a lot more expensive and no one would buy it. So if you're going to do the technology adoption curve, you got to make it like, you know, price acceptable, which means we're not going to get the like highest level components, the chipsets that we need to be able to like really leverage the technology correctly. And then there's chip shortages too and scaling and there's, there's a lot of manufacturing problems that we can't even comprehend because we're just sitting here going, why does not have better chips? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so well, thank much, you. Robin.